But it's great to be here. I'm actually back here, just like Andre. This is my second time. 2013, we had a huge crowd, 500 people in Dipoli. And that was a great event. Two years later, there were 700 people. This year, 1,000 people in one hour after the booking opened. What an achievement. Think about that. <laughs> 400 people were left out. So we, we really need to find larger premises for the next event, much larger. And that's really wonderful. If I think about these past four years, as an entrepreneur, there are many more great Finnish female entrepreneurs. My own investments into startups have many more female CEOs in them in just these four years. So clearly, the interest of women in entrepreneurship seems to have grown. Of course, this is not a sort of a full study of all of Finland, but my subjective feeling is that something good is happening. If I look at the world and Finland from the point of view of a bit larger companies, Nokia, F-Secure, I can see the same. We have wonderful female executives and wonderful growing talent people who are really interested in making a mark in these companies. And I, I feel there's a change. If I look at the world from the point of view of the Federation of Technology Industries of Finland, where I'm chairman at the moment, we have 21% of our employees in the companies that we represent being female at the moment. And that's a very low number, just 21%. We'd greatly love to see many more women. And of course, it's, it all starts at school. So how can we influence young girls to be more interested in technology? And one way to look at that is if you really want to have an impact on the world, on how we solve our fundamental problems, how we solve the, the climate issues, how we solve the pollution of our environment, how do we solve poverty, how do we solve the availability of clean food. These are all technology questions. These are all entrepreneurial questions. Only by the combination of entrepreneurship and technology can we hope to solve these fundamental existential issues? So these are topics that I think girls understand sooner than boys on average. We're all unique. I somehow always hesitate talking about gender because it's hard for me to think about gender as being that meaningful because we are all unique. We are all individuals, but still on average, I think the topics that we have to deal with in the future are topics that girls get interested in earlier than boys. So how do we get these girls to connect the dots? These are topics that are really meaningful for me to solve them, to have an impact on them. Technology is key and we need people who brave the new barriers, entrepreneurial spirit, people who go where others have not gone before. Just a, a few weeks ago, the guy who at the age of 16 decided that he will solve the issue of plastic waste in the Pacific Ocean, he was visiting Finland. The guy who invented the idea that they will build these sort of beams onto the ocean that will just wait for the current to bring the plastic into it, and then they will use container ships to take, take the plastic out. And what a crazy idea. He's now, I think, 23. So he's been working on this dream for seven years. 
and he's making it reality. And that's the kind of entrepreneurial spirit combined with the technology that can save all of us. And why is this becoming more important? It's becoming more important because we are in, at a stage where change is continuing to accelerate. Who of, well, which ones of you feel that change has never been as fast as it's today? Hands up. Almost everybody thinks that way. But I think you are all thinking about it wrong. Because the way you should think about it is something that is more action-oriented. If you just feel that change is hugely fast today, what does that mean? Not that much. But if you think that change will never again be as slow as it is today, then you sort of get a little bit of a sense of urgency. Hey, change will just keep on accelerating. I need to do something right now. I need to run faster to even keep up. And the reason why change is accelerating is because of technology. And if we think about it in the first industrial revolution, we replaced muscles with machines, with steam power, largely in the agricultural industry. And one of the great inventions of that era was the spindle, the big machine that creates fabric out of yarn. Does anybody know how long it took for the spindle to spread around the world? It took 120 years before the spindle was available everywhere in the world. In the second industrial revolution, electricity and the assembly line sort of moved people away from what they had been doing earlier in masses to work on the assembly line to use their dexterity, something that machines couldn't do. And electricity was one of the, the core innovations of that era. Do you know how long it took for electricity to spread around the world? Well, that's the right answer. 17% of the world's population is still without electricity. So it still has not spread everywhere. The third one was about computers and the internet. Four billion people still don't have connectivity to the internet. They are practically all living in an area where there is connectivity. They just lack the means to connect. But the internet spread globally in a decade. So you can see how the time is being compressed all the time. Now the fourth industrial revolution is, you can call it augmenting intelligence. It is about a few trends that are becoming very obvious. One is digitalization, IoT. Both of those create huge amounts of data. Billions and billions of sensors churning data into the cloud every second. And what eats data as a living? Artificial intelligence eats data. It's the fuel that powers artificial intelligence. The more data we have, the more high-quality data we have, the more powerful machine learning we can implement. I have been interested in machine learning for about 30 years. I, I used to do natural language processing when I was in, in the university in the 80s. It didn't work very well, so I gave it up. AI didn't work very well for a long time. In 2006, F-Secure, the cybersecurity company I founded, started using machine learning as a way to recognize malware. That didn't work perfectly either, but it, it sort of almost worked. And in the, around 2012, we started seeing implementations of machine learning that, that really started to work. And I started reading more and more about the topic and talking to people who were the top researchers in the field. And I felt that I understood the, the whole thing quite well. 
and I gave lectures on the topic and I, I made sweeping statements about the future. And then suddenly I realized that actually I don't really get it. I was just, you know, grandstanding with fairly weak knowledge on the topic. I didn't really know how it works. So I decided that I need to go back to school and start studying. I started coding again after a break of almost 30 years. So that, that was fun. And started implementing machine learning, taking courses from a probably the, the best expert in the world, a professor at Stanford who was behind Google Brain and then behind Baidu's investments into AI. And those are the two companies that are most often mentioned as the top, as the top companies in the world for AI, Google and Baidu. And I, I understood the topic in a different way and some things that I believed earlier I understood are much, much more difficult than I thought they would be. Some things are much easier than I thought they, they would be. So it again reminded me that studying, learning, really understanding what you're talking about are so important. And again, sort of gave food to the, the little guy inside me who always doubts authorities, because often the authorities don't actually know what they are talking about. And that's a, a very healthy voice inside of all of us, because oftentimes experts don't know what they are talking about. They just sound like they do. The five things that I, I believe we should do regarding this new era of augmenting intelligence is make sure that we have a high level understanding of what it means, how it works. And it doesn't necessarily take you more than a, a day to really dive into it, if you have good, good material. And of course, that good material is very difficult to find, so it might, may, might take a bit longer. But I think it's artificial intelligence are like spreadsheets. 30 years ago, spreadsheets didn't exist before somebody invented the first spreadsheet. But you all know how a spreadsheet works. Yet, you are not spreadsheet developers. You don't code new spreadsheets. You don't need to understand how they are made. You know what they do, and you know roughly how to use them, every one of you. AI will be exactly the same. For most of us, it's just a tool. It, it helps us make better decisions. And we understand it at the right level. Now, I doubt many of you do. By becoming the, one of the first ones to truly understand it, you'll gain an advantage. You'll understand something fundamental that most others don't understand. So I warmly recommend you to get that understanding. The second thing is to remember that this industrial revolution is fed by data. So it's very important to understand what data do we have. Whatever organization you work in, you need to understand what data you have. What data do you own? What data do you have access to? And it's probably scattered in multiple systems, in multiple locations, multiple storage facilities. But you need to make it all available through a single logical interface so that you can connect any parts of that data set, those data sets you need. So you need a data strategy. You need to make sure that you have access to deeper capabilities in the field of AI, so that when you have an idea, can I solve this business problem with machine learning? You have somebody to go to, to talk about that. And then maybe some people who can help you implement, or who can implement it for you. And you need to apply machine learning for better quality, better functionality, better efficiency, because that provides you the fuel to be more competitive. And you need to embed that intelligence into your products and services. And why do you need to do all that? You need to do it because the future world is fundamentally different. It's not just changing faster, but it's also becoming more unpredictable. And you can 
picture this in your minds by thinking about a, a matrix, a four square, where one axis is the predictability of the environment from very predictable to not predictable at all. And one axis is the comp the, the, how complicated that environment is. So if we take, take the, the first square, which is unpredictable and simple, that's throwing dice. It's very, very simple, but it's quite unpredictable. Then we take predictable but complicated, or let's take predictable and simple. That would be like playing an old video game. Everything happens in the same order at the same time in every game. You just need to learn the right time to press the button. And when you play enough, you'll get very good at that. So that's simple and very predictable. Then if I would ask you to, to program that game, it would be complicated. You would need to learn a programming environment you need to read manuals. You would need to understand it well enough to be able to, to create that game. But it's quite predictable. But then the environment that we will more often find ourselves in is both complicated and unpredictable. And that environment is complex. And Continuing the previous example, if I would ask you to write a game that would become the number one best-selling game in the world, that would be both complicated and unpredictable, because nobody knows what game will become the next best-seller game in the world. It's impossible to predict. And our whole environment through that increasing, accelerating change and all these global issues that we face the overpopulation, the, the refugee problems, the nationalism, the political changes that we are witnessing. I mean, there's so much pressure on all of us in our environment that it's really, really difficult to predict what will happen. And in that kind of a world, we need a different kind of leadership. And I personally believe that women are more powerful on average in that type of leadership that we need. And I'll very quickly, quickly list a few cornerstones of that leadership. One is a sense of ownership, a sense of responsibility, a sense of caring for what you do. I usually compare this with asking people if they have rented cars and everybody has rented a car. Then I ask them, have you washed your rental car? And almost nobody ever washes a rental car because we don't have a sense of ownership. We don't care about that car. But we need to find a place of employment, a, something that we do to help the world that we feel a sense of ownership about. If any of you works today for a company that you think of like a rental car, quit. Go and find a company, an organization that you can think of as your own car and work for that company and do it tomorrow. But women typically think deeper about what they do and have a sense of caring about that. Taking a long-term view is another aspect. And that's such an important thing for all, all leaders. Learning from history while nurturing a healthy suspicion that everything can be done much better. If I do something the same way as I have done before, it just means that I have failed to come up with a better way. We always need to improve. And maybe the last one that I'll, I'll mention is something that is very, very close to me. And I call that paranoid optimism. And that's the healthy balance between being paranoid about what can happen in this more uncertain, unpredictable world, which means that I prepare 
for those scenarios. I think in advance, how do we mitigate, how do we preempt, how do we win even if this would happen? But that gives me reason to be optimistic, because I understand the different scenarios, and I'm prepared. So there's every reason to be optimistic. And an entrepreneur always is optimistic about the future. That is somehow built into at least successful entrepreneurs. You couldn't survive without being optimistic. But you can help yourself being optimistic by being paranoid. And those do need to be in balance. If you're too much of the, the one, then probably you are missing out on something. And there's a long list of other characteristics that I think will be exceedingly valuable in the, the future world, in leaders. And many of those people would naturally associate with females more than males. But in the end, we are all individuals and we are all unique. But you have such a big role, such a big contribution to make, that especially for all the, the young ladies here in the hall, Thank you for being here. It shows that you are interested in having a big impact on your sur surroundings. And just keep going. Make your mark. Help the world. Help all of us. Be entrepreneurial. Be brave. And help all of us making the world a better place. There's an interesting study which showed that when girls go to school, this was about Africa, they tend to invest back 90% of their income when they graduate and they get a better job. They tend to invest back 90% of their income to their family, while men in that same position will invest back only 30 to 40%. So we should make every effort to educate women all around the world, and the more troubled area, the more important it is to educate women, because that brings stability to the families, to the communities, in a different way from men. We men have so much to, to learn. And finally, the first time I was speaking at the first event, I think I finished saying something like, if geeks have this far been associated with pimples, then let's change that. And then let's make sure that in the future world, geeks are associated with lipstick and high heels. And I think that still applies. Thank you very much.